Welcome to this talk that is meant for everyone who is interested in CS thickness and dynamics, especially from a mode sensing perspective. CS deformation and its impact on thickness is still a tricky aspect in CS modeling. In my talk, I'll present you how we can use satellite imagery to provide more observational data to the question how CS deformation changes eyes thickness. I'm Luisa von Alvedel, a PhD student at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany, and I worked on this topic together with my supervisors Christian Haas and Wolfgang Deking. My main focus is CS thickness. This image in the background illustrates well how heterogeneous CS thickness is on local scales. There are flat areas that are interrupted by CS ridges, and they are surrounded by open water areas and leads. Though small scale variability in CS thickness is caused by deformation. How CS deformation works is best illustrated by a schematic like this one. Winds and ocean currents move the sea ice. Locally, this motion may result in ice flows colliding with each other and forming pressure ridges. When ice flows drift apart from each other, they form a lead. Both processes have a strong effect on the ice thickness and the volume. New ice formation is enhanced in leads, and that's how deformation contributes to the total volume in the Arctic. And over ridges, the CS thickness is increasing significantly. In this way, convergence is actually creating a thick ice cover that is more likely than to survive another summer in the Arctic. Because of this strong link between the thickness of the ice and deformation, um, CS deformation is a crucial process that we need to consider when we are going to model the future Arctic sea ice properties. But the big question is, what is actually going to be this role of deformation in the new Arctic? To understand that, we need to consider that sea ice thickness drift and deformation are strongly interlinked by the internal strength of the ice pack and depend on each other. If one property changes as the thickness that is known to thin, the others are probably changing as well. And we have observed that drift speed went up as well as the deformation rates. But what we don't know is, will this enhanced deformation also lead to a thicker ice cover again? Or are there other effects as, for example, strongly uh, enhanced lateral melt at a more fractured ice cover? To answer this question, we need a better understanding of sea ice deformation and its impact on sea ice thickness. Since sea ice deformation takes place really localized in space and time, observing it was challenging before. But now, with the fast repeat cycles of the SAR satellite missions, we have the opportunity to observe sea ice deformation at high spatial and temporal resolution. And that's why the aim of my talk today is to show you um, that and also how we can use satellite remote sensing to understand the effects of deformation on ice thickness. I would like to illustrate this with a case study of a Polynia event that took place in uh, February and March 2018 at the north coast of Greenland. <clears throat> there was uh, this event was surveyed by Sentinel-1 satellites that observed the opening and the closing of the Polynia at nearly daily coverage. In the lower left corner of that animation you see the coastline from which the multi-ice was pushed away by strong offshore blowing winds. The Polynia reached its maximum extent at about uh, end of February and um, at that point then the open ocean started to refreeze. At the same time, the multi-ice surrounding the Polynia pushed the ice backwards uh, to the coast. So uh, the young ice um, yeah, experienced a strong uh, convergence at that time. Um, you can follow this uh, convergence process if you uh, look at the distinct border between the dark young ice and the bright multi-ice in the animation. And in the following, I would like to present you how I actually um, connected those information of deformation that I derived from the satellite images that you're just seeing with um, this, the thickness measurements that were um, made over the young ice in the former Polynia area. So by the end of March, the area of the young ice had more than halved. Um, you can see this on this image where the red line corresponds to the outlines beginning of March, and then the red and, and then the black lines are the outlines 
end of March. And this area decreased by more than a factor of 2.5 left its imprint on the thickness. The thickness was measured by an airborne electromagnetic survey end of March. And this campaign um, found that the mean thickness was about two meters. This is the ice thickness distribution that they measured during their flights along those three profile lines. And the ice thickness distribution already shows that there has been a lot of deformation because um, the tail of the thickness distribution is really long. What is also remarkable is that the model thickness is only about a meter and this model thickness um, corresponds well to the thermodynamic growth that was um, later modeled by a thermodynamic model. So um, this thermodynamic grown ice was actually doubled by the uh, deformation that took place in that region. And uh, this Two numbers, like halving of the area and doubling of the thickness, gives us already a clear idea in which order of magnitude the deformation actually took place and leaves us with a really well-constrained setup in which we can now test the deformation estimates based on the satellite images. Our main aim was then to answer the question whether the deformation based on the satellite images can actually explain this thickness increase. To answer that question, um, so to develop a relationship between the thickness measurements along those profile lines and the deformation the ice had experienced, we needed to find out what the deformation history of the ice actually was. And to do this, we calculated velocity fields from sequential SAR images. Those velocity fields uh, then allowed us to reconstruct the trajectories of the ice, so the pathways. This means starting with the position of the ice during the measurement along those three profile lines, we worked our way back into the past and reconstructed for each day in March where the ice has been located. Here on the map, um, this is exemplarily shown for four white lines, but we have done this in total for 70, 15 trajectories. The trajectories alone did not tell us something about the deformation. That's why we calculated from the velocity fields deformation, as shown here in the background, and combined those information with the trajectories. That means we observed how much ridging and how much lead opening each section of ice experienced along its pathway until we then measured it by our thickness survey. That means we compared deformation information on a uh, 1.4 kilometer spatial scale and nearly days daily resolution, then eventually with the thickness observations. Um, this deformation history was then stacked and yeah, averaged to, uh, to compare it eventually with the thickness information. This graph shows you how divergence or convergence, that is negative divergence, um, it scales with the mean thickness change. The um, individual observations from the trajectories have been here um, averaged into four groups that were, um, were similar. And that's why you can only four, see four um, points here. But what is clearly visible is that there is a proper proportionality between convergence and thickness change and um, that this is actually then also reflected um, by the satellite observations. This means that the deformation derived from the satellite imagery is able to explain the thickness change that we have seen and by implication this also means that we can make use of this relationship to actually calculate dynamic thickness change from SAR images. And that is exactly what we did. We calculated dynamic thickness change um, using the deformation that we calculated from the SAR images along the trajectories. We set up a simple conceptual model for the dynamic thickness change that is basically only based on volume conservation and not too many complicated features. With this, we estimated the thickness of the ice at every day in March from the observed deformation. This time series of trajectories um, that are all averaged into one graph is shown here in gray. Um, if we take now 
this dynamic thickness change and added up to the Fuma dynamic change, uh, this results in the blue curve. The blue curve uh, then was compared to the observations that we had, that is the yellow um, square over there, and you can see that um, the model thickness is actually quite close to the observed one. Um, of course, it is obvious that it is underestimating the mean thickness, um, but this deviation is um, most likely explained by the simple model that we only used to work with the deformation data. First, we didn't consider the porosity of the ice that is likely to increase the, the total thickness uh, again, because all those ridges that have been forming in that area have a higher porosity than the level ice that we assumed. And then second, in our model, we didn't consider that there has been new ice formation whenever um, there was uh, a divergence happening at a later time. And in a sensitivity study, we found that this effect is actually explained to, to explain the deviation of um, 30 centimeters between the model thickness and the observed one. This means with satellite derived deformation information, we can actually model the dynamic thickness change. So far, I've only presented you with a comparison of the mean thicknesses, but I would like to show you that this is also the case um, if, you like, if you look at the thickness variability. Um, this is a ice thickness distribution. It's a histogram of the different ice thicknesses that we measured along the uh, young ice in the polynia, in the former polynia. And um, this in blue is now the ice thickness distribution that we modeled with our simple model and the ice thickness deformation data from the satellites. And as you can see is that they agree really well in this asymmetric shape um, with the dominant mode at about one meter. Of course, the modeled um, ice thickness distribution lacks some of the really thick ice and has a second artificial mode at about 2.2 meters. Both effects are due to the fact that we didn't use any more complex ridging scheme, but we are sure that with a more complicated model that takes into account a proper ridging, this can be even fixed. Let's sum this up. My take home message for you is SAR imagery can be used to quantify dynamic thickness change. And that's actually really important because deformation is crucial for a thick ice cover. Here in our example, convergence doubled the ice thickness. That's why we need to learn more about it and represent it right in our sea ice models. SAR imagery can actually provide us with valuable insights because sea ice thickness change is proportional to convergence that we observed with satellite observations. This is a really important milestone because it gives us the opportunity to calculate thickness change from satellite derived deformation. Given how widely available SAR images now in the Arctic, there is a large potential to use this data set and to study the relevance of dynamic thickness change on pan-Arctic scales. Thanks for hanging on with me until now. More details are in our publication, currently under review in the Christview discussion. I am looking forward to your questions on December the 8th, or if you can't wait until then, via email.